I want to take you to Monday night, April 23rd of 2018. So you're going to hear what his story was to law enforcement. He hears, according to Dave, a trickle of water coming from the tub, calls out for Shanti, doesn't hear anything, continues to go up into the bathroom, and it's at this point that he finds Shanti partially submerged in the tub. And at that point, he thinks she's falling, he panics. This was not a fall. This was a violent attack. In addition to having multiple injuries in multiple places, uh, she was really strangled. The only reasonable explanation for Shanti's death is sitting right there. Welcome to Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. I'm your host, Julie Grant, and this morning we're continuing our coverage of two live trials, both happening in Florida. In Sarasota County, the plaintiffs in the Take Care of Maya civil case are set to rest their case in chief today, with a defense case starting soon thereafter. We'll bring you updates throughout the day on this multi-million dollar tug of war between the Kowalskis and Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. But first, we begin our coverage in Orlando testimony in the bathtub murder case set to resume at any minute. Defendant David Tronez stands trial for first degree murder, but with claims of mental health issues and questionable details surrounding his wife's death. So how will this affect his affect rather his defense case? We'll talk about that on the other side right now. Here's Court TV anchor Michael Ayala with this report. Hello? April 24th, 2018. 49-year-old David Tronis makes a frantic 911 call after he finds his wife, Shanti, dead in the bathtub. She's not breathing. I'm trying to do CPR. I can't Okay, get her listen to me. Are you, can you tell me what your address is? David and Shanti Tronis met online in 2013, and David moved to Florida to be with her and her young son. He bought an older home in Orlando for $600,000 cash. Was it under renovation or? It was fully livable. It was just an older um, Victorian style home. And uh, Shanti wanted to completely open it up in concept. By 2017, David and Shanti were married, and they were overwhelmed by the scale and cost of the renovation. David reportedly told Shanti and others that he had inherited millions from his father. But according to his arrest report, that was a lie. Prosecutors say they frequently fought about money because David didn't have a regular job once he moved to Florida and never paid for anything. Shanti, on the other hand, worked full-time at her financial consultant company and was carrying the family financially. In March of 2018, they were offered the chance to be on a renovation show called Zombie House Flipping. She asked us to be on the show, have our house be one of the homes featured. We would get a lot of what they call trade-outs and um, promotional sponsorship. The week before Shanti's death, she and David met with the show's producers. David wanted to do the show, but Shanti did not. On the day he says he found Shanti in the bathtub, David claimed he last saw her at the house around 9 that morning. He told police he spent the day working in the yard and taking care of their dogs, and that he found her late in the afternoon. Water's like half full. She's submerged partially, but she's also partially not submerged. And one of her legs is kind of sticking up. Obviously, she fell or something happened. However, investigators say that Shanti was killed hours earlier and that her cell phone data shows that she hadn't used her device since about 11 p.m. the night before. The medical examiner said that Shanti died of blunt force trauma to her head and strangulation. David Tronis was arrested four months later and has pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder. His defense team filed multiple motions related to his mental state, but in January of 2023, the judge found that he was competent to stand trial. All right, that was Michael Ayala reporting for us. Let me bring in my guest, retired police sergeant Melissa Pinkleton and Dr. Carol Lieberman, forensic psychiatrist, body language expert, and author. Good morning to you ladies. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, let's just start with our general assessments on where we are at this point. We're starting up week two of this case. Got a couple days in yesterday, but we've seen a good bit of the evidence. Uh, Dr. Carol, uh, what are you thinking about this guy? 
Well, first of all, it, it seems clearly that he must be guilty. I mean, who else did it? But, you know, this, this case reminds me of a case that I saw on Law & Order SVU, uh, where the mother didn't want to go on a reality show or didn't want to continue on a reality show. And the father killed her. I don't know if you saw that. But clear, in this case, they were not getting along. Uh, obviously, the money, the house was causing lots of friction. And I think the thing that did it in the end was her not wanting to be on the show. Hmm. Okay. And so, you know, with respect to this guy, I guess, let me be more clear in my question. Is he a sociopath or is he someone suffering from schizophrenia? Uh, based on what you've seen, and I know you haven't had the benefit of an in-person evaluation, Dr. Carroll, uh, what are the pieces of evidence saying to you at this point? Well, um, his demeanor, you know, on the 911 call and when the police came and so on, uh, they talked about how it, he seemed like he was feigning grief. Um, it, he did seem, from the, the call that we just heard, he did seem like he was all over the place. And, and the fact that he uh, wasn't uh, competent to stand trial for five years, that says a lot. You know, that says that there really was something uh, significantly wrong, schizophrenia or some kind of a, a severe mental illness, or else he would have been able to be made competent sooner than that. All right, Dr. Carroll, thank you. Sergeant Pinkleton, oh boy, do I have a clip for you. Uh, this is in the interrogation room. Uh, we're going to play this and we're going to talk on the other side. The detective is calling this guy out, saying that he has been fake crying for hours. Let's watch. People can be sympathetic when they hear people be honest and remorseful. They can be empathetic to a situation that gets out of hand. But when people lie for hours on end and say, I know nothing about nothing, I don't know how she got that way, I thought she tripped and fell, I wasn't home, I was here, I was there, conveniently, conveniently you're not there. It's complete hogwash. You know, you fake cried for about seven or eight hours today, not one tear came out of your eyes, not one. Not one, not on scene with the officers, not in this room. You have fake cried over this woman's death since we made contact with you for hours. And every single time you fake cried, we wrote it down. Not one tear came out of your eyes, not one. Oh, Sergeant, what'd you think of that technique there? I think that she's a very patient detective because a lot of times after you're interviewing somebody for seven or eight hours and they're playing this game, a lot of times we get to the point where like, all right, dude, let's level with you. And and it's funny because I say this to my kids all the time when they fake cry, I'm like, I want to see a tear. I need to see a tear. And ex so he's doing exactly what my children do when they don't really mean it. He, he, he's presenting like a sociopath. He really is. He's presenting like a sociopath. He thinks that he's a better actor than he is, clearly. And whether he's schizophrenic or not, uh, I don't think that he had a, psycho a schizophrenic break and his other personality did this. Because if you look at the reports in the scene as well, and I don't know if you want me to dig into that or not, but sure, the reporting ahead, officers... Mm -hmm. Okay, the reporting officers on the scene, and it's really important for the reporting officers to document, and they did such a good job, they documented that he was doing this fake crying as well. And then they would ask him a question, and all of a sudden he'd snap to and answer the question. He'd have like a very, you know, he'd answer the question, and then he'd go back to, <laughs> so all of this is an act. It's very, it's very clear, especially for police officers, we are very, very good at reading people, reading body language, and just, we can tell, and from years of experience of who's acting a certain way, who really feels a certain way. And just one last thing real quick too. Sure. I know someone's gonna say, not everybody reacts the same way to, uh, to a horrific crime like this or a horrific scene when they find their loved ones. But there is a societal norm. If we're being honest, there's a societal norm on how people act when their wife or boyfriend, they find someone like that dead and they're the one that discovers the body. And none of, none of these triggers were clicking for the officers. And they did a really good job documenting at the scene and going through and investing this case. And now he's on trial because of the good detective work that was done. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Sergeant Pinkleton, thank you kindly. Got another clip for you. Uh, this is where David Trones uh, is talking in the police interrogation about how he found his wife in the bathroom. The water's like half full. 
she's submerged partially, but she's also partially not submerged, and one of her legs is kind of sticking up and out a little bit. And it's just extremely awful, and it doesn't look natural. Obviously, she fell or something happened. And I, um, I tried to pick her up. I turned the water off. I tried to pick her up. Um, she's, she's stiff. You know, I gotta tell you, just the way he talks kind of gives me the creeps. Uh, how about you at home? Uh, let us know on social media. It's just eerie. It just, it doesn't seem like somebody who's devastated at the loss of their wife and this tragedy uh, that's just occurred in their beloved home. Uh, Dr. Carroll, if you were in the room with him at that point in time, what would you ask that guy? Well, I would ask him about, um, you know, how he puts it all together, like how he figures, the way he describes her, and, and she wasn't all wet, you know, the, the detectives were saying that he said that she was in water and so on, she, her clothes were damp, but she wasn't as wet as he described, which also kind of speaks to perhaps some kind of a psychological problem that he didn't realize that what he was telling didn't make any sense with the, what the scene was. But so I would try to ask him to explain it, like how, if, if she was like that, what you just said, how does that match with how you said that she died. Mm, okay, so kind of put him on the spot, grill him a bit. Sergeant Pinkleton, you know I want to know what you would ask him if you're interrogating him. I would first ask him to stop using that fake voice of, uh, uh, uh. I'd be like, can we just can we just call that a wrap right now because nobody's falling for it. It's been hours. Like, let's just use your real voice and talk about what happened here, okay? Um, I, I'd be like, if she was so wet, why is there dried blood on her? Why are you not wet? Why does the bathtub dry? I mean, there were so many things I documented that are not consistent with his statement. And again, I am not a, I'm not a mental health professional. Could it have been a schizophrenic break? Possibly, but I, I just really, just from everything he's doing and everything he is saying, it seems just very, very calculated, manipulative, and he's not able to pull it off because he's not as smart as he thinks he is. But yeah, the first thing is just, we, we, we gotta stop talking like that because I'm about to reach over. It's right you know, <laughs> with you, that voice. I love it. I, I would love to see you say that to him because that voice, yeah. it's creepy. It's its creepy. It just sounds yes. really creepy. It, we're all thinking about Halloween coming up. Uh, oh my yeah. gosh. We'll see if he talks like that when the judge addresses him. You know we're going to hear his voice when the judge asks him if he wishes to testify and maybe he will want to testify if, if he's a sociopath as uh, one of our uh, other psychology experts has said uh, she believes he is and maybe he'll want to Get up on the stand and tell us some more.